So welcome to this dialogue between myself, Johannes Niederhauser and John Wawake. We already had two dialogues in this constellation before, one on John's channel and one on Johannes' channel. And I will also link, um, put a link to their channels in, in, under this video in the video description. Um, today, we, we wanted to talk about the one and the many. This was a topic that was suggested by Johannes already in the, in the first conversation as a kind of follow up from the previous conversations. Um, so yeah, I, I would just like to ask you to briefly introduce yourselves and maybe you also just want to share some of your thoughts that or write some afterthoughts, something that you took from the last conversations. Um, and then we will um, go into this dialogue. So maybe Johannes, you can start. Okay, so hi, I'm Johannes Niederhauser. I run a little thing called Helkion Guild and Academy. It's also how I know Daniel. Mm. And uh, I know John from Guy Sangstock. And I think we started speaking early 2020. And um, we have, I think what we all share, the three of us, is an uh, an attempt to bring philosophy back to life, let's say, mm -hmm. and to make it consequential and to find responses to our age and the problems that we are facing, nihilism, meaning crisis, etc. What came out for me, I have a few notes from last time. I think John ended it on saying there's a the, the quest for or the quest of formalization has run its course, is coming to an end. There's also a dark side of reason, which perhaps is beginning to show itself. Mm. And there's a musicality of intelligibility that is sometimes forgotten in the processes of rationalization, formalization. And I remember John saying that the one is not system or shape, but musical and can never be fully attained, but only approached. So mm. I'll leave it and that for now, and uh, look forward to discussing this with you. So hello, um, I'm very happy to be here. Um, I've been in ongoing dialogue with both of these gentlemen and uh, very, very happy to do so and to continue to do so. Uh, very enriching. And um, I think uh, Johannes uh, hit the high, high notes and high points very well. Um, a couple things to add to that is I've been in investigating through participant observation and participant experimentation uh, and by reflecting upon um, ancient and fairly modern philosophy, um, uh, a process I call eidetic eduction. It's a new way of trying to understand the forms outside of formalization or the attempt at systematization. but understand them within a practice, a phenomenological practice by which you are transforming the way you are seeing and being in the world in a fundamental way. So this has not only epistemic, but ethical and existential consequence for you. Um, and in that sense, revivify Plato's theory of the forms. I would like to uh, come up with a different name, English name. Um, that's why right now I'm sticking on the Greek word eidos because form is so deeply associated with formalization. Um, and so we're trying to talk about something beyond that, not before it, um, but perhaps beneath it and potentially beyond it. Um, the deeper aspects um, of reason that uh, can be a dark side in both senses of the word, uh, the unacknowledged, the unseen, but also the dark side and like in the dark side of the forest, if they're not properly addressed and uh, acknowledged and appropriated. Um, and so this is also fundamentally uh, a, a, a revivification or inventio of reason, of logos and ratio. Um, and for me, that addresses one further concern, which I'd like to explore today, uh, which uh, in the topic that Johannes introduced, the topic of the one. Um, um, and there's two related ones, two related points. One is an ontological point that 
this phenomenological inactive understanding of the forms um, does not reify them into concrete physical things. So I think it still preserves the heart of what Plato was addressing us to, but it makes them present in a causally efficacious manner in our lives. Um, and I think that is the way in which we can address um, two of the deepest concerns that have always um, been thrown against the Platonic and Neoplatonic tradition. One is a, a profound, and it's worthy of respect, although I, th I ultimately disagree with it, profound intuition that the ultimately real are concrete, specific spatial objects. Um, that's a profound intuition, and nominalism runs off it, and a lot of modernity runs off of that intuition. And it was because, and I think it's a fair criticism of uh, the latter medieval Neoplat Neoplatonic tradition, that they were not properly addressing uh, this intuition. Uh, it's not clear why or how, but we could come back to that. And, and, um, and then the related proposal, which you may not get to, um, which is something I, I've been, I've been, uh, I got from, well, I sort of was inspired by uh, Thomas Plant's book on the, the lost way, the two lost ways of the good or something like that. I'm reading it right now. And he proposes that the Silk Road was not only a Silk Road of trade, but a Silk Road of inter, uh, intercultural communication. And he said that the intellectual, if I can put it that way, or philosophical Silk Road was Neoplatonism. Neoplatonism not only stitches the various forms of Christianity together in the West, it allows Neoplatonism has this amazing capacity to enter into reciprocal reconstruction with various forms of, uh, <clears throat> of Christianity, various forms, not all of both, but various forms of Christianity, deep and influential, various forms of Islam, especially Sufism, uh, Judaism, the Kabbalah. Uh, there seems to have been potential, and this is an ongoing controversy, and that could be brought it back with what is it, the shape of the ancient world, that there seems to have been significant reciprocal reconstruction, perhaps between Vedanta and Neoplatonism. There's been an ongoing um, dance uh, between Neoplatonism and Buddhism, especially through the Kyoto School, and also in the recent work of Thomas Plant, in which he compares the Neoplatonism of Dionysus to Shinran's Pure Land Buddhism in a very insightful manner. Um, and so I'm proposing, these are two proposals linked together, um, not only what you might call a philosophical um, revivication of the forms, but I'm also proposing Neoplatonism as the courtyard that is the alternative to the courtroom that has become the model for our culture. The courtyard of Neoplatonism is a place in which the furniture of our minds and our lives has been disposed so that we can be drawn into it and drawn into conversation together. Um, and Neoplatonism historically had that capacity um, and it also has a transgenerational capacity, as Arthur Bruce Lewis makes very clear in his work. Um, and so I'm proposing Neoplatonism as the courtyard to replace the courtroom where we can find something like a lingua franca of the musicality of intelligibility so that we can commune and communicate with each other without necessarily demanding that we all agree on our final specific sets of propositions. So that is, those are the projects um, that, and, and of course I present them as if they're like this, here's a philosophical discussion of the one and the many, but think about it, the one and the many, hear it, hear it, the one and the many, and then the courtyard that allows and affords the one and the many. That is how those are two deep, deeply linked proposals. That was already <laughs> it's very powerful and great proposal. Um, maybe I, I listened um, before this conversation, I listened to your, um, this was a dialogue you had with Guy Sangstock on the kind of like on the Neoplatonic practice, which we also yes. tried out um, at the, the workshop in the summer, right? Um, yeah. Where, right, this is always right, what, what I'm, I'm kind of interested in. Um, of course, of course. Because, right, this is something we need to practice as well, 
we cannot yes. just talk about it and, and make a kind of like a theory out of it, but we have to practice it. Um, so yeah, yeah, you have to practice Neoplatonism. <laughs> If you only read about Neoplatonism, that, that's, that's like I said, that's like thinking you've made love because you've read the Kama Sutra. Yeah. Right? <laughs> so that's, that's kind of, that's, I think that's also the reason why the Kyoto School, for example, right, Nishitani, Ueda, mm. they were very interested in, in Neoplatonism. Very. And yeah. I think they, there, they thought that we could have the most fruitful dialogue. Um, between the religions, right? Especially, right? They they were all very interested in kind of like Meister Eckhart, negative theology, yep. Yep. Be because there they thought there were the, the, the strongest resonances. Yes, between yes. Mahayana and and um, Christianity, yep. um, and then right then. Nishitani, for example, was also interested in Tillich, for example. Nishida was Very also much. interested in yeah. Tillich, right? Yeah. Then kind of like, how can we realize feo or practice theosis, kind of like, right? Yeah. Realize that the, the, the God beyond the, the God of theism, because that's mm -hmm. kind of like where we got locked in. Yep. Um, so, yeah, I, 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 I would maybe... Maybe if you if you want, we can maybe you can maybe tell us also about the, the kind of like the Neoplatonic practice with the levels. Of, um, sure, because I think that that fits into this conversation. Okay, if Johannes is okay with that, I'll, I'll go ahead. Um, that now that practice, of course, it, it, I, I will modify it by the time of the workshop because that's what you're doing in a workshop. You workshop it, and then you go away and you do revisions and and, and you do further reading and further practice and and so on. Uh, so it'll overlap with that discussion with Guy, but perhaps it'll also have some new 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 parts. So the 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 basics uh, uh, of a Neoplatonic practice is. Um, uh, I'm, I'm tr I, I've, I've coined a phrase to try and get it. I call it consummate conformity. So the, the idea of consummation, of making love, of being wedded, which doesn't mean fusion into an amorphous mass. It means a, you know, a, a tightly coupled rhythmic resonance with somebody in which they're indwelling you, you're indwelling them, and there, right? And there is this, there's this reciprocal opening between you, etc. Um, and so. Um, you, one one of the things you do is you enter into a, a, a basically a mindful state, and you try to sort of first of all just become aware of of awareness, uh, perceptual awareness, imaginal aware, sort of perceptual awareness of sort of actualization, pers imaginal awareness of of, of of virtual. Remember, virtual means potential, real potential, real power, um, and then sort of conceptual awareness of you might call it like the eternal, at least those aspects of our experience that strike us as timeless and spaceless. And you try to engage all of those awarenesses and uh, have them completely interpenetrate. And so first of all, there's that kind of integration of awareness into sort of a, a, a all awareness of all awarenesses, if I can put it that way. And then what you do is you realize that that is, there's a, there's like a, there's a love, in, there's a union in love or a bleed between that taking place within you and without you. Your awareness is simultaneously in and out, and the affordance of your awareness is simultaneously in and out. Um, and so once you get that state of consummate conformity in which you are in union via love, uh, with the depth from the depths of your psyche to, to dispose towards the depths of reality, then you move through the levels. You move into Fusis. And in Fusis, what you're what you're doing is you're 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 realizing within your awareness the continuity of being. And that your awareness and being both depend. They co-depend, they co-realize that continuity. Right? And you'll notice how this picks up on the things we were talking about with the musicality of intelligibility. And then you move from, uh, you do that for a while until that takes, it, it begins to take on a life of its own for you. And, and that corresponds to Fusis. It corresponds to the way physical reality has, it, it blossoms forth from itself. It is continuous. It is springing forth from itself. In a way, we ultimately can't 
right, really explain uh, because any explanation depends on it, relies on it, et cetera. But nevertheless, all, all, it's, not, it's not mute because all explanations participate in it, in that continuity, right? Um, and then you move from Fusis to Suke. You realize that there's a kinetis, right? Your awareness has a for itselfness. It is organized for itself. And then, and this is where, uh, you know, for me, Spinoza is a help. You real, but of course, that is equally the case for every, each and everything and all things together. All things have a for themselvesness and in itselfness. All things are self organized in some way, preserving themselves through time. And, and that's what gives them their independence, their realness from, as distinct from you. Um, so you tap into the fact that, you know, you have a for yourselfness that is inherent to you. And yet you realize that's the case for each and everything. So again, you're doing this in a consummate conformity. That's suke. And this corresponds to that domain of reality that is um, uh, exemplified and disclosed and displayed in living and sentient and cognitive entities. They all really make this much more apparent. Um, and this is again, that, that sense of beauty as the, when appearances disclose reality rather than when they are distracting or distorting uh, reality. And then you move uh, to the level of noesis, which is the level at which uh, it helps if you've done some eidetic eduction practice and dialogos practice, because you're picking up on a co the, the everything in addition to the continuity that you are realizing, not thinking. This is a place where, where you're in a state where the, the difference between instantiation and representation dissolves. You are equally representing and instantiating everything we're talking about here. So there's continuity, then there's kinetis, and then you move to noesis, and that's coherence. Now, it's, it, it, it doesn't exclude, but it doesn't mean merely logical coherence. It means what we've been talking about here, eidetic coherence, right? The, the way all the aspects of a thing cohere together, all, the way all the perspectives cohere together. So, so this is, is world-making coherence. It's not just logical coherence. And that's noesis. That's when you're getting the sense of the, the entire world, I don't want to use the word system, the entire world of intelligibility as a living, vibrant thing. And then you move to henosis. And so, oh, so noesis is the level um, of the idos, of, the, of all the melodies, rhythms, and harmonies of the principles and patterns of intelligibility, and insofar as they world together or to use an ancient word, insofar as they cosmos together. Um, and then of course, I'm picking up again on cosmos relates to beauty again. Okay, so that's noesis. And then you realize that there is a oneness that is a through line that is running through the continuity, the kinetis and the coherence. There are, they, there's a three and one and then one and three of all of those. And that oneness is not a thing, it's a principle. And that's to realize henosis, at least one side of henosis. What's emphasized in the later Neoplatonists and especially uh, 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 made prominent by the Christian Neoplatonic traditions and the Sufi traditions, etc., is that there's a final stage, which is even that principle of oneness you realize in henosis is one by participation. It is, not, it is not itself, right, the source of oneness. And then that's to move into theosis. So that's to take any, any sense you have of the principle of oneness realized in henosis as a symbol that is constantly affording you, but constantly also demanding you to try to go beyond it in this kind of perpetual action that N Gregory Nisa called ec ec epic stasis the continual self-transcendence into the inexhaustible mystery of God. That's theosis. And that corresponds to what the tradition regards as the ultimate reality, because each higher level, so each lower level, and this is where I'm more like Eregina than a classical um, Neoplatonist, each lower level through emergence powers the level above it, but each level above by emanation regulates and shapes 
the level below it. And so there is a dialogos running up and down throughout. And that, it, the argument is, the, the theoretical argument is that is the best disclosure of how intelligibility and its conformity with realness presents itself to us. But in the practice, we're not theorizing about it, we're engaging in theoria. We are actually contemplatively engaged in a consummating conformity to it. And that's the practice. And you can and what you what you become aware of is you become aware, progressively aware in layers of the psyche and in layers of reality, um, how intelligibility is actually unfolding. Was, uh, did that help? Yes, this was great. Uh, Johannes, what do you think about it? Uh, so you, so I, I typically on. do that practice. At, like I'll, I'll do uh, like a, a bunch of movement practices, especially Tai Chi Chuan and, and some uh, Qi Kung. Then I'll do some basic uh, m m mindfulness practices, like the sort of meditative and contemplative. And then I go into this practice. Oh, I'm fine now, sorry. <laughs> Daniel, you can respond. I'm gathering my thoughts. I have a few things I'll say in a minute. If you... Yeah, sure. Um, I think, I think right, the, the, for, for me, the, the crucial point is um, that this is, a, this is a criticism that Nishitani had towards the Neoplatonic tradition, kind of like he goes yeah, against yeah. Right, Heraclitus and the one is a thing and um he, he i don't i don't think that's that's quite quite the case um i think no, in in one in one is my like i had a lag on my computer you're okay you're okay for me okay great um in another paper right nishitani calls this um the non beyond the one so kind of like whenever we try to grasp the one it slips away Yes. And kind of like withdraws into the nun, so to say. Yeah. That yeah, is yeah. really now the no thingness that which can yeah. never be thingified, yes. reified, and, and grasped. Um, but I think that uh, this this is a kind of it's, it's a very it's a criticism that I think is is too too harsh with the tradition because then it's yeah, especially <laughs> when you, even in the pagan tradition. By the time you're at Damasius. Uh, the the ineffable is clearly presented as beyond the 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 sort of uh, Platonian one, or or better, uh, what people are calling the one, and the ineffable captures what Plotinus was trying to point to. There's like it's unclear what Damas if Damasius is saying the first or the second, but that's the scholastic point. And I, and by the time you get to Dionysus and Erigena and and mm -hmm. God, like it's clearly that's the case as well. Um, uh, and so, yeah, I mean, I, 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 I've always thought that those criticisms were, were more directed at, I don't know what to call it. it I, I, I want to be more careful. It's hard for me to know if Nishitani is directing that against a deep reading of the tradition, in which case I think he's made a mistake. Uh, and that's what I thought when I read Religion and Nothingness. Um, or he is pointing to the way many people within academic philosophy have understood yeah. Neoplatonism. Mm -hmm. And if that's the case, its criticism is very well placed. Why does Nishitani or Nishida? I, didn't... I only know of it in Nishitani. Nishitani. Yeah. Yeah. Why, why does he think that the one in Heraclitus is a thing? Because he says, for example, um, when he talks, for example, about the Arche, the fire, yeah. the ever living fire, that's kind of like our imagination is led astray, and then we we think that there's a kind of thing that's that it's for for him in Mahayana Buddhism that the no thingness is articulated better, in his opinion. He has also late. Um, essay where he talks for example about the right the, the emptiness which has always been um symbolized not not represented but symbolized by the sky 
as sort of the, the only truly empty thing that we can actually we can actually see because whenever we we can never we can never reify the sky so to say it's always beyond our understanding it's always ineffable in that sense and for him just the the images or the language that is used by by let's say heraclitus but also just by saying one um, he thinks that this will always lead okay. us that we think there's a, a, a super thing, so to say, that is called yeah. the one. But, but when but when but when Heraclitus speaks of the one, which is only in a few passages, really, or a few, few fragments that we have, is um, so the most important one perhaps is fragment fifty, where he says, "Ukemu alatulogu akusantas homologain." that's not about seeing it's all about hearing and then homologain homologain is so to to übereinstimmen in german to be in to be attuned with and then say the logos so harken back to the logos there's a and, and what's what's now fragment one it's classified as fragment one it's also a um an acoustic relationship with the logos so it's a relationship that comes through hearing and not seeing there's no way you can music is utterly non-representational yeah so. I, I mean i there are these criticisms in religion nothingness of the pre-socratics also of parmenides yeah and I, i'm not i'm not kind of agreeing also with plato so he, um and i'm kind of I was, I was when, when John first mentioned this criticism also in the lecture series and then I picked up on it and I discussed it also with yeah. some people um, and I'm I'm kind of not not agreeing anymore so with those those criticisms I think they are too too harsh and maybe um, but I, I, and, and so I think on that level, I, like I, I, I agree. I, I rejected the, the criticisms for pretty much yeah. from the beginning, publicly yeah. so. But um, again, maybe a little bit of charity towards N Nishitani. I mean, the Stoics certainly pick up on that, right? Reification of the ultimate into uh, a material thing, the fire, right? And and they are by explicit self-description materialists of some kind or they believe that body is the ultimate reality and that uh, the logos is ultimately some kind of fire um, mm -hmm. and so i think nishitani can point to the fact that there is a tradition of taking heraclitus in the way he criticizes a very venerable and influential tradition um, so again i i like I, I initially had a very sort of like what no you just didn't you, that's just wrong you didn't read that stuff but i've come around to think well i mean we have to we have to be charitable and that nishitani especially is getting you know western he's getting western philosophy through the academic philosophy yeah. of heidegger's period yeah. he's, he's being colored in a certain way by heidegger against plato um uh, at least some aspects of heidegger um and that yeah. shows up whereas i think you know, modern scholarship on Plato and Heidegger's re relationship to Plato is a much more complex uh, thing, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. right? Th there's so also, I th think, can, can I just say one thing, one, one yeah. thing, Johannes? There's also something, I didn't know this. I, I, I looked this up like two months ago or so. Yeah. Um, in, the, in the Christian West, for example, there was almost no research, for example, on Gregory of Nyssa until 1942. Then yeah. Hans Urs von Bart Balthasar wrote the first kind of like study on Gregory of Nyssa in 1942, which is is very very late, right? Yeah. And not, now we see like right those theologians that we've mentioned, like David Bentley Hart, or even someone like Jonathan Peugeot, right? Yeah, he's putting out all this content on on those um, people that are very um, um, revered in the in the Eastern tradition, which is again more influenced influenced by um negative theology platonism etc yep. and and i think those those aspects of of um christianity and christian theology have not been available to nishitani and nishida so strongly they have been very especially in the theolo theological studies they've been very influenced by yeah. the, everything Pro Pro protestant theology again tillich bultmann 
etc and this is um this then i think kind of i think if they would read some like the grave with nisa or so i think they would be much more sympathetic to that or, um, or dionysus right? yeah yeah, yeah th that's very much happening and also what's happening <clears> is uh, and this has been in the last 25 years the recovery of out of the argument, what I find persuasive, perhaps even convincing, that Aquinas is much better understood as a Neoplatonist using Aristotle than as an Aristotelian. Um, but again, Nishitani would probably not have had that access to Aquinas. The Aristotelian view of Aquinas was very dominant at, uh, during, his, during his lifetime. Okay, so um, I, I think we, we, we've sort of, uh, we've, we, we've stitched together the possibility that we could include the Kyoto School into this discussion with some revisions, but I want to hear what Johannes has to say about uh, what we've been talking about. A, a brief remark and then a few other things, just on, well, so I think in, there is a way of reading Heidegger where you can say that he, basically blames the entire tradition for being wrong or so. And maybe there are remarks in Heidegger himself that could lead one to that. Mm -hmm. But that would, I think that would lead away from, from the deeper observation, which is something that you, John, touched on as well briefly in, in, in passing is saying that there's, you know, things bubble up, let's just say things, you know, in a vernacular sense, uh, issues, phenomena, et cetera. And we always respond. Um, we always articulate or try to articulate a response to what is and what is not and what is meaningful and what isn't, etc. And there can be ways of responding that then over time, simply to put a very vernacular sense, lose their force. Yes. And they, um, and, and I think this, so what with Heidegger is the catastrophe in Plato is the ensuing Platonism which is to say an assumption that the, the cave, that the, the way out of the cave, the, the, initial, the initial concealment and hiddenness and withdrawal, and also the pain and suffering on the way out, that's forgotten. And what remains intact as, as, as ever present and available is the light of the sun, yes. our idea of the yes. good. Yeah, yeah. And that the rest is being forgotten. Yes. And this is the catastrophe then, as it were, not so much of Plato, but of the tradition that comes out of it. So Heidegger is in that sense really anti-traditional. That, that's, that's the project of destruction um, in, in being in time is to really come back again and again to the origin, which by the way, which always also, this is also how we started this when we, we, we yes. talked about the or plant, the or phenomenon and great, yeah, et cetera. Yep, yep, this yep. is always what happens. I think when, when you think about Chambre uh, Trillard, simulation and simulacrum, yeah. um, this isn't so much about technology. I mean, it is about technology, yes, but it is basically about a system of references that only references itself yes. and can no longer go outside of itself or or appreciate the alien, the other, the strange, the foreign, the weird, the uncanny, which means the unknown, but also the unhomely, and therefore it becomes simulac a simulacrum that is yeah. purely at some point artificial, sterile, dead in the water, basically. And so we, when we, so this 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 talk of the origin, so maybe maybe get get this across better. What's what's meant? So we're not going back in time as it were, but we're trying to access the source um, also yes. through going through the other and through what's alien and, and strange to us so that the world can light up again. Yeah. And there's no formula for it, uh, as it were. And what you're describing, so I think what's important, this now ties me to, you know, when I said I'm gathering my thoughts and this is now coming together with when John, when you went through the practice, I'm not going to go over everything again, of course, but I'm just going to mention a few words that came up. So theoria, yeah. theoria, which is now theory um, and the old distinction since Aristotle of theoria and praxis, of course, has been instrumental for the West, but theoria used to mean a festive ceremony or a parade. So mm -hmm. there is this, oh, but also of course it has to do with, it, it, it's, it is related to theos, and yeah. to seeing so the, the the greek god theos is not a god that is prayed to um they have but but so 
whenever there's a talk of theos in a Greek text, this is a dimension of seeing and being, of being yes. looked at in a certain way, and then we look back at this dimension that's disclosing itself, and then we have to articulate something. This is all tied up with theory and a certain path yeah. that comes with it. But you also mentioned, you said the worlding of the world, yeah. and then used a different word, which is cosmos. Yes. yes. And cosmos ties back with continuum and continuity. Now, if we look at where we are, and, and then I'll give it, you know, give the ball back to you both. Um, modernity is whenever it really begins, but also begins with the explosion of the cosmos, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. with the explosion of yes. the, the continuum, which is not representational in this very strict sense of you cannot really draw it up. You have to think it through. And what Giordano Bruno does, and there's a very good book on this by Alexander Quire from The Closed World to the Infinite Universe. Yes. What yes. Bruno does is he replaces the, the, the Aristotelian continuum, which is, which is a, you know, more or less a, a logical place with, with a geometrical space and then says, but what's outside of it? Yeah. And that's when it begins to pop, you know, the, it, it bursts, begins to burst open. Um, but when, when, when we're tying this back now to, to cosmos and continuum, then we're, 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 we're entering a different understanding of world, uni I mean, universum, if you like, yeah. by the way, also university, yeah. unum, unum adversum, right? That's the one in the many in the Latin sense. Yes. Um, so th there's some, so it's a different understanding of, of, a, of cosmos and cosmology and our place in it that seems to be returning. I, I want to respond to that because I think that was was astute uh, and eloquent. Um, I want to make very very clear um, um, that um, there I'm not I, I, like I said on my tombstone neither nostalgia nor utopia. Yeah, yeah. I'm not yeah. Saying, I'm not saying we can go back or that we should go back to Neoplatonism. I have deep criticisms of historical Neoplatonism, and I think some of the uh, points that Heidegger makes about those are astute. Uh, one of the criticisms that, uh, just to name one that's exemplary for me, is Neoplatonism has a very bad, generally a very bad attitude towards the body. Porphyry begins Plotinus's biography with Plotinus behaved as a person who was always ashamed of having a body. Um, I think this is one of the great mistakes. I think what, what's going on in Neoplatonism, historical Neoplatonism, is a confusion of embodiment with the have, with modal confusion. And, and certain vices and all kinds of, that, that part of Neoplatonism, I think, is very confused. I think also what Johannes said, um, the idea of realness as a, a, as a completable perfection or a perfectible completion, um, which is prevalent in various strains, not all strains, but in various strains of Neoplatonism, um, I think the Heideggerian critique of that is also devastating. And yes, so I'm not proposing we go back. I often say, I'm, what, what we need is a post-nominalist, post-naturalist Neoplatonism, right? Um, and so I'm very much uh, like in uh, like like what it, with eidetic deduction and the 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 practice I took. Either I'm trying to I'm trying to get back to the ecstasis of these uh, right, the enacted ecstasis of what was uh, uh, I think um, the central transformative power within Neoplatonism. Um, so um, I think, Johannes, you, you're exactly right. Uh, and so I think Heidegger's critique of ontotheology prevents any nostalgia of that form uh, from being in place. And it, it, and it, draw, and it demands from us um, the critique of the aspects of the tradition, particularly the Neoplatonic tradition, that contributed significantly to the emergence of nihilism. I've given you two that I think are central and that I do explicitly. Uh, reject and criticize from historical Neoplatonism. Uh, uh, the denigration of embodiment and the idea of reality as completable perfection or perfect, or perfect, or perfect completion. Both of those, I think, need to be uh, rejected. Um, so um, I, I was proposing, though, that Neoplatonism also shows historically one other thing, which is both at the time of the late Renaissance 
And at the, the turn of the 20th century, he was able to enter into deep reciprocal re reconstruction with emerging science. And that holds the possibility of, uh, right, of a deeper kind of reciprocal reconstruction, not only between Neoplatonism and the existing religions, such as Buddhism or in Christianity, but also with, uh, with scientific discourse itself. And I happen to think that something like that is happening within 4E cognitive science. I think the emphasis on sense-making and intelligibility and, and how that discloses itself in eidetic patterns of intelligibility that are enacted between us and the world is a place in which something like that is emerging. Um, so I think everything, the, the points you made, um, I think are, uh, I think are deeply right, Johannes. And um, I just wanted to show you how I acknowledge them and how I've already, and I don't mean this in any, any dismissive way, I've already tried to appreciate them uh, within what I'm doing when I'm talking about this proposal. Nevertheless, I do think that what remains after the critique and after the inventio within our lives of phenomenologically powerful practices, right? What, 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 what we get still is, Neoplatonism provides a historical example of real possibility, and both of thought and of communication and interaction that we can tap into. It is very crucial to see that, to see that within the, the various traditions that are building up, that are only leveling up or layering up or so, and we're standing yeah. somehow within them. And there's a multiplicity of dimensions at work all the time anyways also right and yes yes historically yes. temporally etc uh, and that within that though th there may be common threats and there are those that are you know reinforced by academia and, and knowledge production the way yeah. in which it, it's 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 uh so what, what's in that sense traditional but at the same time when we say you know it, it's not arbitrary to just pick and choose either no uh, exactly what we like yeah. and what we don't like because but instead, I think the task is, and this, this I see this happening, is to to be able to take on what is worthy and necessary to be continued, which may also have been, say, f forgotten or not forgotten, but maybe simply not didn't speak for reasons that we don't know to those who came before us, but now yeah. begins to speak to us. And there's this beautiful line in Nietzsche's Zarathustra thoughts that come on Duff's feet guide the world mm. that, that's always beautiful when you quote that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It, 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 it calls for silence yeah yeah um, Johannes you, you 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 asked us I think this was even in the first conversation we, we had you asked us like like why why is right why is suddenly the one coming again into our view yeah. Yeah. right especially with i think you mentioned the late heidegger suddenly he starts talking again about the yes. all unifying one and yeah yeah that's again now now right some right often we can't make really sense of it why is some why at some point in our in our tradition now this is, kind of like shows forth bursts forth and and comes into our attention again i said this to john in, in one of the dialogues we had I, I i i like that there is this continuity almost from socrates and then through neoplatonism to foy cognitive science on this for example on this insistence on learned ignorance yes, by the, the yes. doctor ignorantia and nicholas of cusa yes. um that we can't have kind of like this this overall account of reality but that it's inexhaustible and that we can fall in in, in in love with those inexhaustible depths and that we can actually right pra practice this this love it's an right it's an aspirational anagogic practice which again which we have in a sense forgotten and then right the Kyoto school for example they, they were really trying to to bring again praxis into the, the the lived philosophical world into the lives of the, the philosophers which right in academic philosophy that that's it's more important often to give theoretical accounts and then everything but 
they were really emphasizing that that necessity of praxis, for example. Um, and right, we, this... we also try to do. Yeah, I'm getting excited today more than I should. Sorry. <laughs> no, it's great. <laughs> Go on. Because, no, uh, <laughs> because th th what's so strange? So you know, it's not even about academia. That there's something, and I'm taking uh, cues here from Reinhard Koselleck's "Vergangene Zukunft." past futures i think is the english title mm. where he says that there's something that occurs in the 18th century we can trace that back where geschichte history itself becomes its own subject mm -hmm. um, mm. and that this is also the moment when isms arrive ideologies become important because the future in a way becomes endlessly open and uncertain and paradoxically he points out becomes planable exactly for that reason Yes, And that means that we now, this is all Koselic, that means that we now begin to use concepts and isms, like all kinds of ideologies, in order to plan the future. But these concepts are ultimately empty of experiential content. There's no practice included in them. So yeah. There's no experience yeah. that goes into these concepts. They, they, so, you know, we're trying to create the future or generate the future or produce the future or influence the future manipulate etc etc and we, we've been building up hundreds of years now of concepts that have almost no experiential content and what i'm hearing here and in, in, in all the work that both of you are doing is that th there needs to be a, a return maybe a bit of this yes but also it must be grounded in practice and therefore experience is that yeah i totally i yeah. mean I mean, I, I originally saw this in Spinoza, uh, but then going backwards, I saw it, it, it's actually really, you know, it's, it's the heart of the Platonic, Neoplatonic tradition, which is there are important truths that are only disclosed in profound transformation. Uh, and so this is the opposite of the Cartesian project, the Leibnizian universal calculus, right? It's the exact opposite. It's no, 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 right? that, that uh, and, 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 and Daniel said it, like our movement into the future is properly understood as aspirational, right? It requires significant transformation of ourselves and it discloses, that transformation discloses uh, real possibilities, realizable possibilities of the world to us that are otherwise inaccessible to us unless we go through the, uh, the uh, unless we go through aspirational transformation. And I think that for me, that is the heart of what I might call platonic spirituality. That and the claim that that, as, that transformation of the self and the disclosing of the reality can mutually support each other in anagoge, which is the, you know, the parable of the cave. I think those two things put together, aspirational transformation and that, 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 that can satisfy the two meta desires of human beings for inner peace and uh, and real contact with real that they can mutually support each other in anagage for me that is the heart of, of platonic spirituality and i i i i think that uh, to use johannes's word that is something that has been backgrounded in the understanding of plato and should be foregrounded i've been trying very hard to re to reprioritize the an anagage as the centrality of the platonic corpus that that is should be at the center, not the theory of the forms or the political organizations, the things that have been emphasized, but precisely that. And that's the part uh, of, uh, uh, right? And then the Neoplatonists said, you can take that anagogic spirituality and you can do reciprocal reconstruction with the best science, namely Aristotle and the Stoics of the, of the day. Those are the, two, those are the two great promises that I think are still viable uh, for us today and should be exacted uh, for us today um, that, you know, that anagage is the heart and that anagage can enter into reciprocal reconstruction with the cut, the best science we have of ourselves and of the world. And, and that, I, st I think, if I had to put it in a way, those are viable promises for me. They, they are, you know, in, in viable in James's sets. These are viable options. They are real promises. And, and, and I, I see them being realized in individual and, uh, and collective lives. And so that's what I want to put 
my finger on is that's the part that I want to get out of the tradition. And it, and it, it, and it, you know, and it carries for a long time through Christianity and Christian Platonism, of course, you know, nominalism and Luther, right. Really in some sense, because Luther so truncates the transformative process, right. He, so, he so reduces it to this moment of sort of complete, co complete capitulation of agency and he remove and separates it off from the wisdom tradition. Um, and, and then it, that gets like, uh, and salvation, you know, they, they separate salvation from sanctification and all kinds of things that are deeply, deeply, deeply problematic. Uh, but I think that that's the current that I see going up to and including uh, Kuza. Um, I really see, I think Kuza is the attempt. Um, well, maybe uh, uh, Spinoza's also. So Kuza and Spinoza are like, uh, Kuza's right as it's happening before and Spinoza is right in the midst of it, right? But it's like, they're both trying to say, no, 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 we can't separate this from practice. If you read Kuza, the, the deepest intellectual moves are woven into his description of contemplative practices that you should be engaging in. Like you, you can't understand the argument without the, it's, that's like the Thomas. Same thing with Spinoza. If you read, if you read the, eth pay attention to the title, right? If you read the ethics as a treatise, you're, and you're not practicing it, you don't get it. I'm re I really, I'm, I'm, I'm becoming more convinced of it. So I do think, Johannes, that, that is the key. You're really on fire today. That, that is the key uh, of what uh, I see. And I, I perhaps I think that was, that was the key also that the Kyoto School was resonating with in people like Eckhart, et cetera. I, it's absolutely the key and, and, and ideology is, is like like you said it, it's it's the it, it's the final surrender to to the, the will to power within the Leibnizian calculus it's like no no I don't have to transform at all right all I have to do is believe and the only the only transformation is the revolution right yeah I think uh, I agree with you totally. This that's the disaster of modernity. Th Daniel, uh, you, you seem to want, you want to say something. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, no, but I, I'll, I'll be quiet. That's... No, no, your enthusiasm has been really infectious yeah. and really <laughs> insightful. It's been really wonderful. I wonder if then, if there's a bit of, if we could turn more properly yeah. towards the one and the mini, because part, yeah. the third part of the, <laughs> so those are the first two parts of the proposal and the degree which they are plausibly promising is the third part of the proposal is uh, Neoplatonism seems to have been uh, the, the best place where we can, within praxis and in theory and in theory, address uh, the problem of the one and the mini. Um, and, and, I, and I take that very seriously. And the fact that current philosophical theologians like, uh, like D.C. Schindler and especially Clark, I mean, Clark's book, The One and the Many, is that argument uh, through and through, it, right? That uh, Neoplatonism uh, gave us a way, uh, and I want to use this verb, and I want to use it the way it's used in the word Israel, where we're wrestling with God, because wrestling is also a form of conformity, dynamic conformity. Right, um, like in martial arts, you can really only get to know somebody in a certain way when you wrestle with them. There's like there's 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 there's, a, there's something there about, it. but that Neoplatonism wrestled with the one and the many in in a really profound way that I think is still very helpful for us today. Um, so I mean, and so the the basic proposal is that you get in the one in Neoplatonism, you get the proposal that the one and the many is resolved. Uh, resolved and we'll have to talk about that in the notion of participation and i think that to be a, to be a very very powerful and the, and the idea about participation is it exactly bleeds between theor theory theoria and praxis right it, it's not you have to participate you have to participate in participation to really know what participation is um uh, and so I, I that that would be the third thing i'm proposing um and maybe we could turn to that uh, more properly. So uh, if I could say one, so we already have a, a layered 
a layered epistemology and ontology, right? So, and, and people are really, they think they're being nominalists, but they gleefully say things like, although it's a kind of nominalism that bleeds back into a suppressed kind of Neoplatonism, they'll, they'll say things like, love is just a chemical interaction in your brain. So what they're saying is, here's a level that we have phenomenological access to, but it's not as real as this lower level. And then of course you can say, yeah, but the chemical interactions are just molecular interactions that are just atomic interactions that are just, and, and this is Ned Block's point that this, the bottom drops out of this, but notice it's just inverted. It's a kind of inverted Neoplatonism. At the bottom is the inexhaustible fount of, right, oneness, either, either historically in the Big Bang or the entangled one field uh, out of which everything emerges in quantum mechanics. And those are so also linked in some semi-mythological way because we don't have a good theory for linking them right now, right? And everything emerges up. But it's a neoplatonic structure, the re except uh, the really real is at the bottom and everything bubbles up from it. But, you know, and Katz made this argument a long time ago in the metaphysics of meaning in the 80s. He said, you know, these two ways, uh, emergence up and emanation down, are, are, are perfectly symmetrical, right? They're perfectly symmetrical with, they, and they have, they have, right, uh, uh, what is it, obverse, like they, they have like, they, where one is, one is strong, the other is precisely weak. They, they, they have sort of a perfect complementarity uh, to each other. Um, so, you know, uh, the, the, the bottom up people can sort of e explain the causal power and emergence of things, sort of, uh, but they can't explain why there's a normative, intelligible uh, structure to intelligibility, right? The Platonists have traditionally had the problem, they can explain why things are intelligible and why there's normative, why there's the true, the good, and the beautiful, but they can't explain why it has any causal power. That's been their traditional problem. Um, and so I think later Neoplatonism, especially Eregina, in which emergence and emanation completely interpenetrate each other and take very seriously the complementarity and the, the symmetry. I think every argument that uh, relies on emergence can just be inverted and be an argument that relies on emanation, for example, right? Well, oh, but you know, everything emerges up from the quantum realm or everything emanates down from the cosmic realm, like, like ugh, right? Okay. And, and so I think that Neoplatonism actually um, can respond to our, our scientific ontology in depth. And at the same time, like I said, what I'm trying to do with eidetic deduction, go to the heart of our phenomenal of the phenomenology of intelligibility. And that's why I propose it as an excellent candidate for telling us how to not only think about but how to enter into right relationship with the one and the many. So that's the proposal. There's a lot more, but I'm trying to give the gist of it as quickly as, as possible. Um, so I, I apologize if it's very sort of sketchy, uh, but I'm trying to make it as clear as possible that what the third proposal is. No, no, I, I think that's, that's great. Um, and Right for for me maybe the key is also then right and how how do we realize this right how do we yeah, practice yeah. it because I think that's that's in a sense also that's what we have to do we yes. have we have to practice it and and realize it and so to say re realize that neither just emergence nor just emanation kind of like can give us this complete ontology of reality. And don't you, I mean, am, am I reading into things, but I, don't you see that in Nishitani? That's exactly, uh, yeah, yeah. What, that's exactly what's going on in Nishitani, right? It's, it, it's this and this are both wrong. It's this, right? right? It's like, I, I don't know how to do it. My hand gestures are failing me. But that, I, I see that what I proposed as resonating deeply with what, what Nishitani is trying to get us into, right? He wants us to really realize the real self-realization of reality, right? Mm. And that's his definition for religion. Yeah, and he, right, he, he always, he, he makes those kind of like moves where he kind of like goes up and down. And he, right, yes. he calls this, this movements of the circumcessional interpenetration. Yes, yes, right? yes. I, yes. I think that's still the best word for, <laughs> for what yeah. you kind of like try to describe. Um, I, I agree.
I agree. Yeah, Johannes, you you also you looked enthusiastic. <laughs> go on, go on, Daniel. No, no, it's it's. I mean, Nishitani is kind of like dancing through the layers a little bit in the text. Yes. And you, you kind of like you 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 go with the flow in in the text. It's almost like a magical incantation what he's doing. It's it's kind of like a rare. It's it's one of the most participatory texts I know. Um, so much, so much. <laughs> and, and, you know, the only other text where. The only well, there's a couple of texts, but the uh, like it's like what what I first encountered this um, uh, in, in I, I don't know what adjective Western thought when I was reading Plotinus because I was astonished that like I realized I was reading an argument and doing a spiritual practice at the same time as I was reading the text, and I thought oh, and he, and like you said, the only place where I had seen that before was in Buddhist philosophies, and especially in, in, in Nishitani, where you're like, you, you, it's, it, it, it's, it's as much adverbial as it is adjectival, right? right? You're, you're not just getting predicates that you put into propositions. You, you're getting perspectives that you're enacting, right? You, right? And so, yeah, I, I, I think that. I, I always have, right, I, when we talk about this, right, I always have to think about, um, there's a quote from Francisco Varela in the introduction yeah. book from Robert Carter, where Varela talks about, right, we have to realize the kind of like the virtuality, both of self and the world. Yes, yes. And that we're not static selves and the world is also not static, yes, yeah. but there's always this real possibility with which we learn to kind of like in, in praxis, yeah. we have yeah. to engage in and aspire to and and realize those those steps constantly right um and when you read those texts right i mean when then at the buddhists talk about no self and this just means right that we self and world are, are constantly co-emerging and co-creating yes. and co-shaping yes. and uh, each other and that but the promise, right? The promise is, right? We can we can come into greater clarity and conformity with, with with the world, so to say, if we engage in those those practices. Um, and yeah, the only point I can just make is, right? Even Nishida said that his own ontology, um, which he tried to develop. Is can only be realized right if, if you also have a deep practice of, of meditation. Totally. Totally. And that's I think it's a, it's a, it's it's one of the most fruitful attempts in this again in this um, bringing back the uh, deep unity of, of theory and, and praxis in in our time. That's what I see in the Kyoto School, and that's also what I see in your work. That's why I kind of fell in love with your work because you're also emphasizing this so much. Um, I, I mean, it's become a, a prioritization heuristic for me. I prioritize engaging with thinkers that do that. I, I, of course, I read other stuff. You have to read other stuff historically, scientific, and that's totally legitimate. But the 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 the, the to use Quine's model, what's at the core of my web of beliefs is the, the belief that we should be, uh, we should prioritize those kinds of work, not just text, because we have to work with it in the way we're talking. So I, I like the, 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 the term work. Maybe there's a better German term. The Germans always have better terms, um, right? Uh, but yeah, um, yeah. but there's a, there, 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 I, 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 I tend to focus on the works uh, uh, that have that characteristic to them, Daniel. That's been a. That's becoming a guiding heuristic for me. I mean, we could almost say that the university used to be that locus, yes, of that practice, which is why it is called a university. Um, and it, in for some, you know, multiple reasons why perhaps it's either currently lost a bit of its ways or. Some would argue it's, it's it's this is it. Um, we don't have to talk about this here. But so it, this is not. I don't think I wouldn't say at least personally that anyone who's ever taught at uh, at, at a university, including the German idealists, are completely off, and uh, they were all just per se wrong or misguided 
because yeah. they were teaching at university. No, I mean, it used to be a very different place. I think one of the things that Heidegger suffers through, and he makes this public very early on, 1929, at his inauguration, you have the guts to do this, uh, at his inauguration lecture in Freiburg, where he says, what is a university? At this point, it's just a, it's a superficial external uh, bureaucratic uh, organization. <laughs> um, you know, not, nothing ties this into one anymore, what we're doing. Yes. And um, so, but I think the university was that place once. It may be, again, for reasons we can't really go into here now, uh, why it's, it's the, I don't think we'll have the time now. We can do maybe some other time, but not necessarily yeah. why, why this has occurred. But this will lead us astray. But I think then at the same time, we can see an exit from certain now rigid, weird structures that are no longer helpful for this bridging of theory and praxis. Precise. So I think, you know, this exiting from is, is necessitated, but also enables us at the same time to come together here and other places and explore this further which has been forgotten within that place where it, you know, so we can make jokes about how Hegel was a, almost like a prophet when he spoke at university, but in some sense he was not yeah. prophetic, but he was a, in, a, in some sense, a, a, a priest like figure and, 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 and importantly so um, because he channeled something of meaning at the university, which then spread through, through the city of Berlin and further. Um, and th that is no longer the case. It's now encapsulated, you know, the, the, the papers are, as again, we're back in the simulacrum. We don't have to go into a machine world. It's, it's the reference system that references only itself and doesn't go back to the original source or doesn't try to make an original experience with the source. So reading a text, I mean, just wanted to stress this again what Daniel said before and then you agreed with John. Um, is that reading a text such as religion and nothingness it isn't you know just information oh. but can be a transformative yeah. experience if we let ourselves in on that if we allow that to happen and to be done to us i mean there's a certain suffering aspect to it right it's, it's um but all you know you have to be open to it so it's, it's somewhere in between active and passive um yeah so and so I'll leave it at that for now, and then maybe I'll say something on the one of the many uh, in, a, in a bit, in a couple of minutes. So. Well, I think I think the I think the point there. Um, I mean, there is a specific point about the university. I mean, the, the university used to be the home of the liberal arts. They were liberating. They were transformative, and they were the place where you talked about the one and the many. Hence the name university. And all of that's gone. All of that's gone. Uh, the the idea that this is a place where uh, where you undergo uh, aspirational transformation. Agnes Callard has written about that is something that is sort of given lip service to, but in, in funding and practice, it, 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 it's, it's, it's marginalized. Um, and the idea that we're, we are going to reflect on the one and the many um, in a profound way that will resonate with the lived intelligibility of real lives. Like, what? Uh, that, 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 that is not given a kind of centrality. You may take a, a philosophy course here or there and um, etc. So I agree with that critique. Um, yeah, I, we, we should talk about that at, at length at another point. I guess yeah. what the point I want to get out from that, though, was you, you dropped a really, uh, what I thought was another one of your golden nuggets from today, which is, right, you, you were saying it's neither active nor passive, we have to participate in it. And this is what I mean about there's something, the, 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 the fact that our, our, our deepest right relationships are participatory, I think, discloses something about the nature of reality itself. That our capacities for self-realization in both senses of the word are ultimately depend on, um, both ontologically and psychologically, the self-realization capacities of the world. And that we we need to recover that. And, and, and again, this is a I think this is a very clear point. And think about the convergence it gives us in Nishitani and in, in, in the Neoplatonic tradition, at least the parts of it that I've been trying to emphasize. Um, and so I think that is 
it go it, it go it, it goes right into the wrestling we do in our lives. And Heidegger made this very clear that we background it so deeply that but at some level we are trying to get how being can be so one and so many at the same time. Uh, we, like look around me, there are all these beings. They're so radically different from each other, yet somehow they're all one in being. And, and I like, and I, you know, in the pre-Socratics, and Heidegger's right about the pre-Socratics are starting to going, oh, like, <laughs> like there's a, right, they're doing that about that. It's like, oh, do you see this? Do you see it? Do you, and I, you know, what, what, Heraclitus, you're so dark and all that, right? But like, they're trying to say, do you see this? Do you see this? Do you realize this? And I think, uh, I think waking people up to that I mean, that's what Heidegger did for me and, uh, and, uh, and Spinoza. And then later Pl Plotinus is like, oh, right, right. I'm acting as if I have resolved this. I'm acting my life as if I've resolved this and I haven't. And therefore I am engaging in a profound kind of bullshit, a really profound kind of bullshit because I'm acting as if I've resolved the one and the many, instead of coming in astonishment and wonder before it, and then engaging in profound transformation in order to get into right relationship with it. That's so, I, yeah, that's yeah. right. Go ahead, so, Johanna. To translate this, you know, to, to resolve. So, what I think what you're saying is that it's not about finding, say, and we could. A formal logical say explanation or solution yeah. to the problem of the yeah. one and the many to problema yeah, 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 greek yeah. greek the greeks what yeah. does it mean it means cliff edge yes yes that's the and it and it means riddle and yes problem in some sense and but inherently it has its solution within it but the top problema, so the blema is the, the same, uh, it comes from ballo, which means to throw, which also you have in symbol, to throw together, in yeah. diabolos, to, to throw through and through, the devil. Uh, right. and, and, and the problema is, is, is that which uh, is thrown in front of us and throwing itself up there. So once we have climbed the cliff, we haven't, it doesn't, it's not gone, it doesn't disappear. What does it, what what is transformed is is we where we stand and our relationship to it mm. is a different one yes so it's not about you know because to solve can also mean to I mean to dissolve and yeah. really auflösen right and yeah. the analytical uh, approach is so luo in greek means to destroy analuo means to dissolve that so any kind of yeah. analytic is really to dissolve which is important sometimes because then we are with all these premises and all of this over here and another but then we need it to come back together again not purely and so with yeah. with a problema that that is coming so this is not about dissolving but participating in it yes and <laughs> jump in anytime um no, and, no, and I going. we i think we see that in fragment b10 in Her uh, heraclitus where he actually makes a reference also to the melodic so he speaks of syn adon di adon so you know tuning together coming attuned together yes. and sounding yeah. but also yeah. di adon at the same time the so two participle gerondif's yeah. constructions were coming together sounding attuning alike and then not yes. and then there's a this tune or or or, or so again uh, yeah. and then he says uh Kai ek panton hen, kai ex henos panta, and out of all one, and out of one many. Ah, yes, exactly, exactly. But always continuous. Yes, yes. We're back with continuity. There's the continuity of the one and the many. Yes, yes. Yeah. Uh, the, yes. the only thing I could add to this, um, right, Johannes? We talked about this one year ago, right, in the early in the early Greek seminar, right? Um, yeah. I, I did this, right, this um, little talk about the, the medial in, in Greek language, because, right, this in Heraclitus is, it's... Middle voice. The middle voice. That's kind yeah. of like, it's, it's kind of like in language, this is, the English language is, is maybe... Useless about this, I know. <laughs> <laughs> the, I, I found a paper by, by a 
uh, German philosophy professor who wrote on the, the medial in, in Nishitani and Nishida, saying that he, he's, they are also imply, implying this, um, this medial all the time, because in Japanese yeah. you can do this better. And it's kind of like, it's the best, I think it's the best grammatical um, form that also expresses yeah. this deep participation. Yeah. A kind of like, it's almost as if things are, are mo moving by themselves. It's, it's yeah. like reality realizes itself, the world yes. worlds. And this is kind of what, right, what Heidegger tried to um, also express in those, those um, um, phrases that when you hear them for the first time, they, they, they sound very cryptic, right? But, yeah, yeah. yeah. But that, that's right. This is kind of like it's a poetic aspect, I think, of what we are talking about. Um, so I would pick up on that and say, yeah, we, English is impoverished with respect to the middle voice, but we enact, we, we people trapped within English, <laughs> uh, we can enact the middle voice within the we space of dialogos. And um, that is why I think dialogos is so important. And I think what you see happening in these practices, and Guy Senstock and I have talked about this a lot, is you know, how the, how, first of all, you constellate and cultivate the philia, but it can, it doesn't always, but it can turn towards Sophia. And what starts to happen for people, I think is a, a consummate kind of conformity. They start to realize that the, that the dialogos of interpersonal being resonates with the dialogos of being, that being is in some deep sense dialogical, and they are participating in that when they are realizing dialogos in these dialogical practices. And, 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 I, and you can see it happen. You can see people, they first, they first get, whoa, I'm intimately into me, but into you, and we're indwelling each other. And then there's this we thing that is now growing, a, a geist, right? A, a logos between us all, right? A, 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 and wow, and wow, and wow. And, and, and they're getting the one and the many of the interpersonal. And that, that and but then it turns towards, oh, but the one and the many, right? And they start using religious terms about spirit and being, um, and I don't think that's I don't think that's coincidental. Um, I think why that keeps happening is precisely because, like I said, the 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 transformative disclosure within dialogos of the dialogos of reality, I think is um, it, it, it is what the Neoplatonic tradition, and I think you agreed, Daniel, um, uh, the Kyoto school, especially the Shatana, is pointing to, and Johannes, you seem to be resonating with this a lot, um, and so. Um, that is again where I mean where 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 you know the the Neoplatonic rubber hits the the road because uh, I don't know if you have that expression but we have an expression in English where the rubber hits the road right uh, you you make the perfect wheel but when it actually hits the road it has to be in contact and it's partially destroyed in meeting the road and rolling itself forward and it needs the road in order to actually move forward and all there's a lot in that metaphor and it's a wonderful uh, metaphor. Um, and so for me, that's what, that, that's what for me, that's what gives me what Jasper has called philosophical faith. It gives me, it gives me the sense that we can, we can, we can engage in a process of co in both senses between us and between us and the world, co-realization of reality that is deeply transformative of a, and deeply, and, and I don't know what other, what other word, uh, deeply nourishing sort of psycho-ontologically nourishing to us. Yeah, I mean, since since you, I think you, right, on, since you first introduced your, your practice of right, the philosophical fellowship, and then yeah. also with Guy Seng, so we did a few videos where we did all sorts of practices. Since you introduced it, right, I'm practicing it quite regularly, and it's almost, asto it's always astonishing how, how, deep the intimacy is yeah. and how language starts to speak itself almost and we just yes. participate yes. in this yes and it's so yes. it's so beautiful um and yeah it, it's beautiful but remember rilke it's dangerous uh, <laughs> which means um uh, you know in the sense there, there's ways in which it it, it it goes awry like people can get caught up in sort of 
insight porn, or they can get caught up in just the, the in, interpersonal intimacy. Um, uh, uh, it, so you, 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 this is a meta practice, right? It has to be in constant dialogue with an ecology of practices where people are um, really wrestling with the dangers of self-deception, individual and collective self-deception. And that has to be constantly wedded uh, to dialogical practice. Uh, be, like I, I've been saying this, I said, what distractions are to mindfulness practices, projections are to dialogical practices. And projection comes up a lot, both negative and positive. And so getting people to become aware of that and the way it can disrupt, it gets, it's, it, it, and, it, and, and I've, I've learned to be more patient because originally I was frustrated because I would give people very explicit instructions. When you're in this practice, don't talk about yourself. Don't get into autobiography. And you, and I, you visit the rooms while they're, and people are doing their autobiography. And I'm saying, no, no, stop, stop, stop talking about yourself, right? Don't do autobiography. Be, you're trying to draw the other person out and afford them giving birth to their thoughts. And they'll go, oh, right. And they'll, and, like, and so there's, there, we're talking very positively about all of this and we should, I'm not denying that, but I, 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 I do want to note that we have to, right, we have to wed these practices to ecologies of practices in which, you know, people are learning to really become aware yeah. of and engage with self-deception, both individually and collectively. Um, yeah. So I just wanted or to put that out. Go ahead. Sorry, or you're back with the simulacrum. I mean, so yeah, exactly, so, exactly, yeah. exactly, exactly, this, exactly. So I, I pull out this book for the second time this week, uh, actually with a dialogue that I recorded with Daniel. Um, the machine stops by Ian oh, Foster yeah. from 1909. He basically 110 years ago describes what we're doing right now. You know, sitting together, uh, each in our little cells, um, thousands of miles apart, talking about ideas. <laughs> um, the difference would be here, explicitly, original ideas are prohibited. They are warned, yeah. you know, so it's explicitly you should talk about tertiary ideas, uh, quotes of quotes of quotes. And so the machine is a parable, of course, for the, it's, it's, it's our Plato's cave myth for our time. But it's also a parable for how, in some sense, we can be that machine or can become yes. that machine, that simulacrum. So, you know, it's not outside of us. It's not the, it's not the machines taking over and putting our yeah. bodies in little pots and then ex extracting <laughs> energies. That happens maybe to a certain degree, <laughs> but it's the way in which we reference ourselves and our being with others that we can either be in the simulacrum and we sometimes will have to be, right? We don't need simulation, et cetera, uh, in order to learn something, for example, but then we have to step out of it and step out of it and step out of it. Yeah, Th that's so. And that's how the machine, as it were, stops without stop. Because we talked about technology, etc., also last time. Um, how the, you call it um, performative self contradiction? I think. Yes. Uh, <laughs> so yes. How we, <laughs> you know? So if you wonder how to stop the machine, respond differently to. The, mach the machine as it were and and step outside it, difficult enough uh and even and every every stepping outside isn't absolute or final no isn't, you haven't reached enlightenment oh here i am i'm, <laughs> I'm enlightened now just no it, it, the moment of enlightenment is perhaps where where the real real work begins then as it were i just wanted to say uh i don't know if you know this because um, you made reference to the matrix and how it's not, you know, blah, blah, blah. Right. Yeah. In, the, in, the, in the original story, the, the machines actually use the computational power of the human brains and they network it. It's not energy that they're extracting from us. It's the capacity for intelligibility that they're incorporating. And so it's a much more participatory metaphor. I don't know why they abandoned that. I guess they thought the audience couldn't grok that or something. Because it's it makes no sense that we're in an energy sort. Oh, we're like a battery. What? Right? <laughs> a combination of fusion and what? If they have fusion, they don't need this. So the, the story falls apart. And it's, it, it's unfortunate because if they had done what they originally thought, it would have been tr a, tr a better parable, uh, precisely because, uh, you know, we would be participating, like you said, 
at the very fiber of our uh, of our meaning making in the machinery. And I, I think I would just wanted to throw that in there because uh, if they had kept the original intent, I think it, it would have been to use the way you've been using this word. If they had kept their original intent, it would have been closer to the origin um, uh, in, in a powerful way. So um, I, I don't know. I, uh, we should probably start wrapping. I just this wanted up. to say. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Uh, yeah, um, we should wrap it up. Um, right, right. I just wanted. It was great talking to you. Thank you for coming. I thought this was a really enriching dialogue. Um, maybe we'll have another one at some point. Um, yeah, I would just like to end it there. Um, and Thank you both.